Today, as Becky says, we're publishing two reports for you. Lucky you, we've got two reports for you. So we have our progress report um, and some new advice on the Welsh climate targets. I'm going to, I'm going to focus mainly on the second of those things today. Um, what we have provided is, I think, uh, a, a genuinely comprehensive set of recommendations and all of the insight and analysis that you would expect from uh, the CCC um, in it uh, and in these two reports. It builds very much on all the other work we've been doing over the past couple of years, looking at net zero for the UK, and we'll come in to discuss what that means for Wales in just a second. Um, just before I kick off, though, um, I wanted to pay tribute to my colleagues, Tom and Marilee, um, uh, under the leadership of, of, of David Joffe, for bringing all of this together during what has been a really extraordinary period for the CCC. I feel very privileged to be able to present this analysis to you this morning. Um, they're with us uh, on the webinar, and we will hear from them, from them later in the Q&A. Uh, and last instruction before we kick off is please, if you haven't already, download the reports that we have uh, published today. Take some time to read them. Uh, they are, I think, a real route map for Welsh emissions and um, and perhaps even the Welsh economy and, 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 and Welsh society. So that's the importance, I think, of what we're about to talk about. So let's move on to the first slide. And um, uh, just a short word on methodology. And this is not the place I would normally start a presentation, but I think it merits it this time. James, you could just rattle on to the next one. Thank you. We have brought the full CCC toolkit to bear on the challenge of Welsh emissions in, in the uh, reports that we published today. Um, our work draws very heavily on the UK work uh, that we have been doing, and you might have seen reported over the past few weeks, uh, to build uh, an assessment of how the UK itself can get to net zero. And the way that we do that, which again, I won't go into too much detail on, is that we build bottom up a set of scenarios abatement strategies, literally thousands of measures across the economy uh, to understand how we can cut emissions to meet the statutory targets for the UK and for Wales. In this assessment, we are advising a new target for Wales. So we've used that apparatus, which is based fundamentally in the science of climate change itself and the commitments that the UK made uh, on the international stage under the Paris Accord. So everything that you hear today is going to be compatible with that. So far, so, 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 so good. But what we've also done this year is, uh, is bring this, this more scenario-based approach uh, to bear on the challenge of Welsh emissions. Uh, in, in common with the UK, um, what we've been doing is trying to understand in some detail how we can get to net, net zero through a range of different paths. Um, last year, we advised that the UK should set a net zero target of, uh, by 2050 for all greenhouse gases. But we could only model, just as Becky said, a 95% reduction for Wales by that date. This year, we take that analysis to a new level of detail, which is allowing us to go further and to give that advice that it is now the time for Wales to set its net zero goal. So the way we've done that is with these scenarios particularly. So I just wanted to just, just briefly talk about that because I think it is a new and exciting part of our, um, our armory this year in, in bringing this assessment to you. What we have here is three um, illustrative scenarios uh, for how the, uh, the, uh, the targets can be met. So we have uh, in the red corner there, the headwind scenario, which is very similar to the assessment that we made last year in our net zero report. That's a world where uh, we are getting to the goal of net zero by making uh, lots of centrally planned infrastructure decisions. Carbon capture features very highly and strongly in that scenario, and lots of hydrogen provision as well. Um, the engagement scenario is really interesting scenario. That's one where we wanted to explore well, where people are more responsive to the challenge of cutting carbon. Businesses too are more responsive. So it's a world with lots of behavior change. And for me, the most interesting of the three scenarios that we, that we have here today is the, is, the, is the widespread innovation scenario. That's a scenario where we're looking at uh, changes to technology, uh, those uh, technologies that drive us to uh, zero carbon being more readily adopted it's also a world where we have a very cheap power price, so it's an electrified world in particular. So those three illustrative scenarios all get to net zero under their own steam. They're each exploring uh, a different theme of the transition ahead, so infrastructure, uh, behavior change, uh, and technology or, or, or innovation. Um, they each get there under their own steam. They're not, there, they're not however, the, um, the, the, the only way of doing it. So we're, we've deliberately put these scenarios together so that we can understand a bit more of what those paths might look like. That has allowed us to build a fourth scenario. So James, if you move on, this is our tailwind scenario. And this is something we were really, really keen to explore in the CCC 
building on the work of last year's report on net zero, we wanted to explore a world where everything goes well. So we get the best of the infrastructure, uh, the best of the behavior change, the best of the innovation. We bring all that together. This is the world that gets to net zero early. And you will see in a second the implication for Wales. It's a highly optimistic take on what could happen. Uh, interestingly, though, it only gets there a few years earlier. So for me, this, this scenario is, is most interesting because I think it demonstrates that the target that we're recommending for Wales today and the target that we have now enshrined in law for the UK is genuinely ambitious. Really, really tough target to meet, but of course appropriate for the, uh, for the needs uh, of the Paris Agreement. And then lastly, that allows us to build the thing that we're going to be talking most about after this today uh, is the balanced net zero pathway. And again, I'll show you in a second what this means for Wales, but this is the fifth of the scenarios that we have built uh, for emissions abatement. Um, the goal of this scenario is to, is to try and steer a course through those other illustrative scenarios, a more balanced course. Um, we've looked at those bottom up uh, strategies in every sector. We try to pick out the changes ahead that we regard as being uh, moderate, balanced, achievable. And crucially, what this, we're trying to do here is progress as much as we can through the 2020s and keep open the options in those illustrative scenarios through the 2030s and 40s, keeping those things in play with the things that we are recommending on that balanced pathway. So let's move on then to what we are actually recommending, James, and thanks very much. We can move on to the next slide, James, actually. So this is the key chart. These are our new recommendations for Wales. The headline here is that we are recommending a net zero goal by 2050, net zero for all greenhouse gases, uh, but we will need real ambition to get there. And in effect, this pathway amounts to bringing forward the old 80% target from 2050 to 2035. That's the implication of net zero for Wales, hugely ambitious. And we are gonna run out shortly of coal-fired power plants to, to close. So we are, we are, we're gonna to have to make more and more effort to get to this kind of goal. And we'll have more on that in a second. We think this path represents a, a fair and a credible contribution to the UK's net zero target, which is in turn an ambitious contribution to the global agreement uh, made in Paris. Really important to say that. The path that you see here is consistent with our recommendations for the UK's sixth carbon budget, which we launched last week. Um, and it's also consistent with the UK's NDC, the 2030 target for emissions, which Boris Johnson has now submitted to the UN process, again, in line with our advice. So this is all bringing this together in a very consistent way. This is genuinely ambitious, we think, but also genuinely achievable as a path. Uh, and crucially, it's a front loaded path. So if you could look over the next 30 years of emissions reductions for Wales, divide that into two 15 year chunks, about two thirds of the required emissions reductions over the next 30 years would be achieved in the first half, uh, the first 15 years. That's important because it, it will minimize the cumulative contribution that Wales is making to the problem of climate change, cumulative emissions. It's also a, a statement that we need to invest early. That will support the Welsh economic recovery after COVID, of course. And crucially, and I think it is the crucial point, we are opening up the options uh, by going early on that transition, opening up the options to create new industries, new employment, uh, the options to go even faster, potentially on emissions reduction later. You can see here that we're recommending a tightening of the second Welsh carbon budget period uh, to 37% reduction, reduction from 1990. That's at a minimum to account for the early closure of Aberthaw uh, power station. And we've also set out recommended targets uh, for 2013, 2040. So those interim targets are 63% at 2030, 89% at 2040. So I hope you can see the shape of that chart. If we just move on to the next slide, I'm going to show you the paths to those illustrative scenarios that I talked about. And just have a look at the shape of that chart. It's an inverted S, if you can see it overall. That tells a story tells a story that initially what we're doing is scaling up uh, at the outset of this journey ahead of us, ramping up the policy effort, preparing consumers, preparing businesses for the things that will come next. Then we get this very rapid fall in emissions over the 2030s, which I hope you can see there, really sharp falls across all of the scenarios. This is a chart looking at emissions reduction in Wales without engineered removals. Uh, we have natural removals in there, but not uh, bioengine with CCS uh, or direct air capture. Um, that 
tells you a little about the internal discussion that the CCC went through in coming to our recommendations. We have two or three of these scenarios getting to net zero without those engineered removals, but look, there's some of them that aren't. So this is this is a tight uh, a tight proposal. Our balanced net zero pathway, as you can see, here, without removals, doesn't get all the way there. In the end, though, we think there is enough flex uh, in the things ahead of the next 30 years for Wales to set that net zero goal with confidence now. But my earlier point still stands that clearly rests on upping the policy ambition now, pushing as hard as possible now to deliver those sharp emissions reductions in the 2030s. So that decade ahead of us is really a decade when we need to make strong policy decisions and then we get the response after that in terms of emissions. On to the next slide, thanks. Just another take on that. Uh, here you can see, uh, James, on the next slide. Oh, that's not the right slide. Um, never mind. I'm sure we can work that out. Um, another take on that, you could, the, the balanced pathway that we're recommending and the range of possible emissions reductions that we think are achievable. Um, uh, and we've looked at, in the chart at least, in the document, you'll see there is a chart looking at uh, the range of emissions that we think could come with um, uh, those engineered removals that I just talked about. The difference between uh, the, 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 the line I've just shown you on this chart, the balanced net zero pathway and the, and, the, and, the, and the pathway that we're recommending today to net zero is made up either by greenhouse gas removals or doing more on uh, cutting emissions more generally across the, the Welsh economy. Uh, we think there's the capacity to do that. It would take about 4% of the total UK greenhouse gas removals that we're recommending uh, for, to close the Welsh gap. So there's enough capacity in there to do that. Now we go on an adventure to see what the next slide is. So James, let's see what there is there. Uh, let's move on from that one. Okay, good, back on track. So um, supporting uh, the UK targets and the international effort is what I would like to talk about next. And let's talk about how these recommendations fit with those UK recommendations that we made uh, last week. Um, next slide, thanks. This is the UK version of the recommendations that we are talking about today. Uh, again, note that S shape for UK uh, emissions, uh, which again is telling that story that I've just told about Wales, but the need to scale up the UK ambition early and see the return in terms of emissions reductions uh, over the 2030s. Just a few things to note on the UK chart. Uh, we're talking again about an increased ambition, which is the product of having set a net zero goal last year. Um, so the old 80% target that the UK used to have for cutting greenhouse gas emissions has now been brought forward by 15 years for the UK as well. You can see on that chart the uh, 2030 NDC recommendation that we made as well, at least a 68% reduction, which the Prime Minister then took to the UN uh, at the weekend. Um, these are the UK carbon budgets, and you can see that broadly they're in the right the right place. Uh, the fifth of the UK carbon budgets is the last blue chunk that you see there. And uh, that the importance of that NDC recommendation is that there is a there is that, that budget is loose. So it's really important that the Prime Minister has made that commitment. But just look at the drop there in the in the orange uh, sixth carbon budget, the recommendation that we've made. Next year we will find out whether ministers uh, in Westminster are happy to legislate that recommended target. We of course hope that they will. Now, having seen that chart and the Welsh version, we thought it might be useful just to set out a comparison of the effort. So next slide, thanks, James. So this is the comparison of the effort between Wales and the UK as a whole. And you can see, I hope, how well matched that effort is over the next 30 years. We're stripping out removals and uh, aviation here. Slightly steeper fall initially uh, in Welsh emissions before we level off and then a plunge in Welsh emissions, if I can put it that way, over the 2030s. And then we match quite well the UK uh, as a whole, the chart for the UK over the 2040s. We think this is a fair burden share overall. Um, and uh, you can see how, how closely matched that ambition is for the whole of the UK and Wales. And it's a, it's a measure of the, the journey that we will be making in lockstep. So Wales is not making this journey alone. This is a UK wide journey. Uh, and overall, the effort that's needed to get to Welsh net zero is being matched by uh, the UK as a whole. A final chart on this, thanks James, next one. Um, just looking at the share of emissions abatement from Wales as a part of the whole of the UK again, so another take on this. 8% uh, roughly of emissions today are Welsh across the UK, and we're doing 8% of the total abatement in Wales as well. 
uh, rises a bit to uh, around 9% over the mid 2030s to reflect the fact that there is a, a bigger fall then too. But again, another measure of the, uh, you know, an equal and fair uh, burden share across the UK for the, for the goal of getting to net zero across the UK. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And lastly, this is one of my favourite slides, really stunning chart comparing Wales to the global effort. Now, just a bit of explanation about this chart. Here we're looking at uh, per person emissions globally. So this is, the, uh, this is the requirement of the Paris Agreement if you were to look at emissions per head of the population globally. And interestingly, what you see on this chart initially is that flat line, that black line, which is the historical uh, emissions per head story across the world. And um, it's surprising to see that for some. Uh, we have been flatlining on, uh, on that basis uh, over the past 30 years. We've been growing the population, though, which has been pushing emissions up. Now, what's necessary to reach the Paris goals of well below two degrees centigrade uh, uh, warming threshold or best efforts for one and a half, you can see in the two coloured lines on that chart. So we need to turn that black line uh, and then follow uh, preferably the green line there, which would take us to one and a half degrees. And you can see how that works. The global goal here is to get to net zero uh, somewhere in the 2070s uh, on that path to be compatible with the uh, temperature agreement reached in Paris. Now, the reason I like this, is if we can just overlay the path that we're recommending today on that chart, Thanks, James. Wales is very obviously starting from a higher place than that global average. It's also starting from a higher place than the UK average, again, on a per, mission, a per head of population basis, thanks to um, Welsh industrial emissions. So Wales is higher, and therefore the fall must be steeper to net zero. By 2035, Wales has passed that two degree centigrade line. I hope you can see that there. And around 2040, it's hitting the one and a half degree line. And then we've gone past that by 2050. So that is a measure of how ambitious uh, this target is. Again, it's the right target for Wales, and we're, we're, um, we're recommending that today on this basis. We also think it's a fair contribution, especially as the UK Wade pathway stays within that uh, one and a half to two degree uh, corridor of, of, uh, of emissions per head over the next 15 years. But really stunning uh, to see that. That's, the, that's a measure of the progress that we need to make over the next 30 years and a, a really interesting story historically since 1990 as well. Okay, let's move on then to the more interesting question of how Wales can deliver that outcome. And uh, let's start with, I think, the prettiest chart you will see today. We call this our rainbow chart. Um, and this is the... Um, uh, this is the emissions abatement necessary for Wales to get to net zero. And what you can see here, I hope, is that it's made up broadly of four strategies to abate carbon across the Welsh economy. Uh, the first of those is the kind of purpley stripes at the top. That's reducing demand for high carbon activities. Second of them is the big bit. That's the kind of orangey yellows and reds. That's about the take up of low carbon solutions, especially the orange bit, which is electrification of the, of the Welsh economy. Thirdly, expanding energy supplies, but doing that in a, in a low carbon way. That's the blue chunk. And you can see how much of a contribution that's making in Wales. The green bit is the transformation in land. And um, something we didn't have on the UK version of this chart is the fifth bit, which is the flexibility that we think is necessary to meet net zero overall. And I'll just go through these uh, in turn. So let's start with the question of reducing demand and being more efficient. Uh, in line with the committee's uh, recommendation for uh, the UK as a whole, we are in this, uh, in this advice advocating a shift in diets, moving away in Wales from meat and dairy products. Um, uh, we're also wasting less in this, uh, in this assessment. So the importance of this here is that by 2050, that, that might, uh, might only be a small proportion of the total carbon abatement that you see across the Welsh economy, but in the early years, it's really significant. So it looks like on that chart, about a third of the emissions uh, abatement that we will see over the next few years comes through the demand reduction and efficiency measures. Uh, this is also not just about diet shifts uh, on re or reducing waste. It's also about buildings becoming better insulated. It's about vehicle industrial efficiency as well. Um, we think those changes can happen over time and they, they tend to bring multiple benefits, not just carbon benefits, but also benefits to health, to well-being, to the economy as well. So it's a really important step and it's really nice to be able to show you in this chart. Um, the second uh, section is about take up of low carbon solutions. This is the big one for me. This is where you'll see a lot of the biggest changes. Um, here we're seeing people, we're seeing businesses uh, adopt uh, low carbon solutions, buying assets that are zero carbon rather than high carbon. 
Uh, by the early 2030s, we've got to the point where all new cars and van sales, all new boiler replacements in homes uh, are low carbon. Uh, in our assessment, they're largely electric. Uh, by 2040, you've got uh, all new heavy goods vehicles, all new purchases of those vehicles are, are zero carbon. Uh, we've got the South Wales industrial cluster and other industrial sites in Wales switching away from fossil fuels to low carbon alternatives, installing carbon capture and storage technologies at scale from about the mid 2030s. That's all in that, in those kind of three middle chunks there of electrification, of the use of hydrogen and of CO2 capture. Really, really important though. And, and again, nice to be able to show you how that changes over time. And hopefully you can see how that really grows over the 2030s. So that's doing a lot of the effort. The next is the blue section. This is the expanding our low carbon energy supplies. This is really about cleaning up the electricity system. Clean electricity then we can use for transport, uh, for heating buildings, and we can also use in industry. Uh, in Wales, uh, low carbon electricity generation is going to shift from about 27% of the mix now to 100% by 2035. So we're looking at cutting Welsh power emissions by more than 95% in this chart. Uh, we're also looking here at low carbon hydrogen supply, so producing that either through electricity, through electrolysis, or by using uh, carbon capture with, uh, with natural gas. Um, uh, that we think that hydrogen is useful in, in a whole host of places, especially in shipping as a fuel, probably as ammonia, uh, and crucially in industry, in those areas where we can't electrify those industrial processes. So it's a good substitution for um, where we especially right now use natural gas uh, for high process heat. Um, and then lastly, transforming land. So we do need a transformation in the way that Wales uses its land. There's a nice chart I'll show you in a second about the range of options we have there. By 2030, 43,000 hectares of mixed woodland we think should be planted in Wales to remove that CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, we're growing that uh, by 2050 to 180,000 hectares. That is a major new change to the way that we use land. That brings all sorts of benefits. You can also think of it as a new, uh, a, a new commercial activity in, in and of itself. So uh, that's going to require uh, agricultural land to change. And the other change that's happening here is that we've got 56,000 hectares of agricultural land shifting to bioenergy production by 2050, whilst maintaining the amount of food overall that we are producing per head at the moment. We've also got lots of peatland being restored there. Wales um, needs to restore peatland and manage that sustainably as a carbon store, also as a real step forward in biodiversity and in restoring nature. And then that black section at the end there is the flexibility that we think will be needed to get all the way to net zero. Um, there's, you can see, I hope there, that it's a relatively small proportion of the total abatement necessary to get to net zero by 2050. And we think there's enough flex in the range of options that we've talked about in those four things to get to the goal of Welsh net zero uh, with confidence. So we're happy to recommend that today, although we're not specifying exactly how to get there. As you can see, that, that wedge grows over the late 2030s and into the 2040s, and there's enough time to develop the options, we think. On to the next chart then, and again, it's another one, another great chart. I'm so pleased I'm able to, that we're able to talk about it today. So what actually delivers that goal of net zero for Wales is in large part an investment challenge. It is a challenge to grow the amount of investment that we are seeing across the economy in Wales, scaling it up from today to 2030 by around two to three billion pounds each year of extra investment, extra capex in the Welsh economy to deliver net zero. You can see where that, that capex goes um, in the sectors there. Uh, it delivers, uh, that delivers net zero, but it also delivers something which is, I think, in many ways more important to the story that we've been talking about today. That's the stuff that's below the line. So, yes, we do have this extra capex requirement, this extra investment, this extra investment cost across the economy in Wales in 2030. Um, this is a more capital intensive discussion, uh, a more capital intensive transition uh, than we would be doing if we weren't trying to aim for net zero overall. But it also delivers not just net zero, but this amazing fuel saving to the Welsh economy. Uh, that's the stuff that's below the line there. And what you can see here is that this is the money that we're not spending on fossil fuels anymore. Uh, it's the money that's not being spent on inefficient fossil fuel technologies. Now, fascinating and really exciting people to talk about, about that saving. It eventually cancels out the investment cost over time, which I hope you can see that builds up over time, that saving in fuel savings across the Welsh economy 
grows to cancel out the investment cost over time. Can't, how, can't overstate really how important that insight is. Uh, it's great that we can model it and show you the profile of it. It means overall that the costs are now much lower for this transition. So let's look at that next. And uh, just to give you a sense of how those costs in, in overall change, we're looking at the change in the resource cost, which is effectively the net position of those uh, capital investments and savings. And you can see that they, they rise over, over the period, but they rise to about 2 billion by the end of that period. But that's much, much less than we thought they would be at even just last year uh, in our assessment for the net zero report. Um, we're not saying here that this is a cost to the Welsh government, important to say, or the Welsh taxpayer. Uh, an important discussion that we need to have about how these costs are met and shared among uh, citizens in Wales and across the UK. That's two billion or so that we get to by 2050, as I say, is much lower than it was last year, but it is nonetheless a real cost. The reason it's come down is because we're doing less of the expensive stuff to get to net zero. So less of the expensive greenhouse gas removals, for example. But crucially, what we're plugging in here is a cheaper and cheaper power price. So we've seen those, uh, those power prices fall since we produced our report last year, which has this cross economy impact on the overall cost. Now that's really positive. And of course, we expect that that could continue into the future. We're not assuming that we'll get those uh, rapid cost falls into the future. We do, we do assume some uh, some additional fall in the in the cost of, of electricity in the future. But that process of innovating, cutting the cost is what's led to this remarkable fall, even in just 12 months. Uh, and that process is one I would expect to continue. But again, really important to say that although the costs overall we see as relatively small, there will be impacts, particularly for those sectors that use fossil fuels extensively. So think about the oil and gas sector and potentially the automotive sector. That needs to be managed carefully. Very strong message in this report about the need for this transition to be fair, uh, that we consider not just the cost, but also spreading the benefits as, as well as the costs across the economy, benefits and opportunities that come with the transition that we have ahead of us, especially in things like buildings retrofit. Um, and that cost is going to be in some sectors more than others. So we need to consider how we can manage this in such a way that we protect industry uh, and consumers from the cost of domestic heat carbonisation and industrial carbonization, uh, decarbonisation, and potentially also spread the benefits of where we think there will be cost savings, particularly in, in the transition and surface transport, which we now think is an overall saving to the Welsh economy by 2050. All of that said, these are high-end numbers. Uh, we are not here factoring in what we think would be a GDP moving investment programme uh, necessary to get to the Welsh goal of net zero. Uh, the fact here is that we are modernising the whole capital stock of the Welsh economy um, over a, a remarkably small period. That can only be a positive thing. Uh, we think, therefore, there's a boost, potentially at least, to GDP of around 2% by 2030 by making these kind of climate investments, a boost to employment too. Uh, and in particular, as we recover from a pandemic, this is not really a resource cost at all. This is us using up spare capacity in the Welsh economy in a really sensible way using investments, particularly when borrowing costs are low, uh, as a means to, to, to prop up the Welsh economy and the Welsh recovery. At the end of that, you get a lot more than just net zero, of course. You get these modernised industries, you get the health benefits, you get cleaner air, you get uh, a better natural environment, more livable homes. These are all really sensible things to be doing on any grounds, never mind climate grounds. So this, I think, amounts to a really strong proposition overall. And we think overall, therefore, that this is a cost that is, is, that is certainly worth incurring uh, especially with those benefits. Potentially, the cost overall likely to be zero if you wrap in, or closer to zero at least, wrap in some of those extra benefits. Let's move on to the next slide. We've also considered the well-being goals, which in general we are a huge fan of uh, in the committee. Um, this, we think, is a transition that matches those goals really well. Strong messages in the report here about the need for a just transition, a fair transition, and crucially one that is uh, that is uh, it, it, that is seen to be fair by Welsh people. Uh, the many ways that this transition will improve health outcomes feature strongly in our assessments. Uh, we're going to make Wales more energy secure if we go down this journey, um, uh, go down this path with us, uh, and more resilient to climate change itself. Fits very well, of course, with the resilient Wales. It's going to place Wales, we think, in the right place globally uh, when it comes to the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, crucially, the Paris Agreement, which we'll be discussing a lot over the next 12 months. And most important of all, 
my, uh, I've probably said this several times now, this is a prescription we think for new investment and new jobs across the Welsh economy and therefore entirely worth it. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, thanks. And lastly, just to give you a sense of the enormous changes that come with this path that we are recommending today, the changes implied by that goal of net zero, just a whiz through the energy impacts that we're foreseeing for the Welsh energy sector if these recommendations are adopted and acted upon. Uh, they are awesome in every sense of the world. So let's start with oil. Fossil fuels largely phased out by 2015. You can see that particularly on this chart. So oil down a massive 95% by 2050. What little is left there is being used in aviation for jet fuel. We move on to the next one. Natural gas uh, down 60% today is a little less than the fall for the rest of the UK. That reflects the uh, continuing industrial use of natural gas with CCS in Welsh industry, also in power generation, which you can see here. We've phased out natural gas use for heat completely in Welsh buildings in line with the UK advice. Natural gas boilers need to stop being sold by 2033 at the latest in our, in our assessment. On to the, uh, onto the low carbon energy changes and um, a doubling of the size overall of the electricity system over the next 30 years in Wales to meet all the new needs that we have for that uh, increasingly uh, green and, uh, and zero carbon electricity uh, in transport and to heat buildings. Just look at the red section on that chart, that's, it. that's electrical heat. Uh, we think increasingly with heat pumps over the next 30 years. That is mostly supplied with renewable generation, of course, by 2050. We are using renewables really as the backbone of the whole power system and therefore the whole energy system as we electrify the economy. And um, next one is hydrogen. Um, and we can't electrify everything. So for what cannot be electrified, we turn to hydrogen as a replacement for fossil fuel use. And really a stunning increase in hydrogen demand from 2030s onward. Uh, that hydrogen, of course, has to be clean. So in its the supply, uh, we're using that extensively as a clean fuel in industry uh, and as a shipping fuel as well, as you can see here. And then lastly, on this whistle stop tour of changes is, uh, is land use. And we can see on this chart the changes in land use that we, uh, we have across the five scenarios. And I've shown you the five scenarios here, just a reminder that we have those scenarios. Land use is an area that really does look different across those five scenarios clearly a different range of outcomes that can be achieved in line with the goal of net zero emissions for Wales that we are recommending today. It will be policy that drives these changes. So the big change in our latest report is to build, I think, a better understanding of how diet change is freeing up agricultural land over the next 30 years. We're modelling a 20% fall in, meat con in all meat consumption by 2030. Uh, that rises to about a third by 2050. Crucially, we're not just modelling a, a change in red meat consumption here. It's all meat. And that means we freed up more agricultural land than before, which could be rewilded or turned back to a use that's better for nature with the right support for farmers and land managers to do that. What you can see here is that there is a surplus here of land release. So there's lots of options what we could do with that. The big story here is probably the increase in forestry that you can see in the green sections uh, across the scenarios. Uh, in our balanced pathway, uh, forestry rises from about 15% of Wales land area now to a quarter in 2050. Clearly, very live policy debate with yesterday's new sustainable farming scheme news. Uh, we haven't quite had the chance to digest that yet. I had a look at the headlines last night. It certainly looks like it's aiming at the right stuff. So that's great. So aiming at the right kind of environmental outcomes that we think would be delivered across these scenarios that I've set out for you today. And the very last slide for me, the very last point from me, is just to highlight how much change is now on the way to drive this kind of change that I've been advocating and recommending in my presentation this morning. Uh, this is just a, I mean, to be honest, it's not an exhaustive list of the things that are coming over 2021, the policies that have been promised already by the Welsh and UK ministers. Uh, it is a genuinely amazing moment if you work on policy on climate. Uh, I can't remember a time like this in the 10 years plus I've worked on it. Uh, we may not have a moment like it again. This is really what is promised in the, uh, before the Glasgow COP next year. And that's the logic of it, I think, is that we have all this effort stacked before the world's gaze turns to the UK uh, in November next year. And this is just what is promised. There may be more over and above that, and especially after the Welsh parliamentary elections next year, all before Glasgow COP next year. And there is a chance to end on a positive note, just a glimmer, that we can get things in good order before the world's leaders dis descend upon Glasgow, my hometown, next year. And I think that would be a really wonderful outcome, complementing the new targets that we 
really hope and expect now that Wales will set on the basis of this advice. So I'll stop there and just to say thanks very much for tuning in and uh, back to you, Becky.